You are having to put up just with me without my lovely assistant, Karen Place, who makes such wonderful introductions. She's still fighting a cold of some sort, so she sends her regards and uh, we'll be here at the next one, I'm sure. Um, there are a lot of scenic byways and nice drives in this country. Many of you have been on these. Um, one is the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut. Another is the Blue Ridge Parkway over the Appalachian chain. Uh, going to the Sun Road in Montana, that's an amazing one. You can also drive up and down Highway, U.S. Highway 1 on the East Coast or 101 on the West Coast and get a similar feeling. So there are a lot of interesting scenic byways and drives in this country. I've picked this one because it's got a lot of history and it's called the Mississippi. Now motoring on the Mississippi, I'm not going to do an amphibian sort of thing, but there is a thing called the Great River Road that runs all the way from Winnipeg all the way down to New Orleans. And it follows both sides of the river up and down. We, we were not able to do the whole thing, but we're going to go through parts of it. A couple caveats. One, we did this 21 years ago, so things have changed. Secondly, there are a lot of you who will be familiar with some of these sites and I welcome your input at the end to talk about your experiences in those places or things that I've omitted. So here we go. From September 17th to 29, 2003, this trip took us over 1,600 miles up and down the Great River Road through Illinois, Iowa, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Missouri. Uh, there were many opportunities to revel in the history of this area and to understand the impact of river transportation on our country's past. Here's another picture of how it runs. It shows it only up to Minnesota, but I know that I know that there the road actually goes up into Canada somewhere. September 17th, Chicago to if I'm saying this right, Chillicothe. Mm -hmm. yes. um, we flew into Chicago in time to join commuter traffic <coughs> and went to Chillicothe. Now why? <coughs> because there was a Super 8 there and it's a perfect driving distance for this late hour. With stomachs grumbling, we found that the few restaurants there closed at 8 p.m. Luckily, we found the River City Bar and Grill. And although the kitchen was closed, we dined on gourmet popcorn and rather tasteless frozen pizza. But the beer was good, and it was karaoke night. The River City has a huge karaoke system used regularly by the locals. Um, in addition to several computer poker games. For Wednesday night it was pretty busy, but probably the only game in town. This was a long day from Chillicothe to St. Charles, Missouri. Uh, we had our basic juice, coffee, and maple bars, and we headed south, headed west, let's see, on 174 and made our first stop in Galesburg. This is the site of Knox College and the home of Port Carl Sandburg. <coughs> Following a brief stop at his home, now a state historic site, we continue west onto the Great River Road, also known as GRR. We stopped at Nakota for the first, our first real surprise was at Nauvoo, the first U.S. settlement of Joseph Smith and the Mormon faith. The original temple was destroyed when the faith moved to Salt Lake City. The new one was completed in 2002. This LDS Mecca is visited by busloads of Mormons and tourists. It's an amazing structure and an unexpected find for us. After a short video and drive around the historic buildings, we continued south from Hamilton, briefly into Iowa again at Keokuk, a major dam site on the river. <coughs> After Seattle's dry summer, we found this area surprisingly green and lush. Many trees were heavily infested with caterpillars. Cicadas serenaded us constantly and loudly. Corn and soybean fields abound along the river and adjoining fields. The GRR, Great River Road, continues south on US 61 and 24 in Missouri, 
with their next stop being Hannibal Mo, <coughs> Mark Twain's country. Hannibal's truly a tourist town, but being at the end of the season, things were pretty quiet. We toured the Mark Twain Museum, his home, and saw the famous picket fence and home of Becky Thatcher. After the tour and a stroll through Hannibal, we dined at a, at a book nook restaurant where Bradley, the server, entertained with stories about the local area. Unfortunately, he indicated that Hannibal has virtually nothing to offer young people and that most leave as soon as they are through school. Cradled between two hills and the river, Hannibal is a beautiful sight, especially from Lover's Leap, the hill on the south. <clears throat> Missouri 79 took us south from Hannibal through, through Louisiana and Clarksville Two old riverboat stops which are struggling to attract tourists. At Winfield, we found the sign directing us to the ferry boat, one of two that we would like to take across the river into Calhoun <laughs> County, Illinois. We stopped at a picnic table with a handmade sign that said, wait here. These small barges pushed by small tugboats hold about 15 cars and are similar to those used on the upper Columbia River in Washington. We were one of three vehicles on this trip. Jeff, a retired steel worker, was our captain and poised for photos. Once across the river, it was surprisingly twisty hilly drive past the gold abandoned farmhouses and more corn and soybean fields to Golden Eagle for our next little ferry back to, Saint, to Missouri to St. Charles, our start for the night. This is Calhoun County. Uh, not a real busy place, actually. <laughs> So we stopped at St. Charles, one of the many restored towns along the GRR. St. Charles <coughs> is probably the best. This was the first overnight stop for Lewis and Clark on their way west. Its old buildings on Main Street stretch for almost a mile along the river. We walked the full length past a plethora of stores and restaurants looking for that perfect eating spot. Um, we found it at Lewis and Clark's with a New Orleans style third Four balcony overlooking the street. Cicadas singing, the river in the background, and a warm, pleasant evening. This is what it should feel like. We stayed at the Fairfield that night and had a fair breakfast. In our room, we could see the I 70 traffic rush to and from St. Louis. Friday, September 19th. St. Charles to Memphis, 310 miles, another long drive. <laughs> we hustled along the road, passed through Bloomdale, a picturesque ridge of homes overlooking a peaceful green valley and rolling hills. Our first stop was historic St. Genevieve, the first permanent Missouri settlement in 1725. One forgets that many river colonies began at the same time, or not long after those on the East Coast. Remember, river travel brought many French explorers to this area. Remember the Louisiana Purchase. Present day concrete and national chains surround peaceful towns, many with empty or abandoned buildings. I wonder what will be considered tourist worthy in the future. With Memphis Bethany, we caught I-55 southbound and made a brief stop at New Madrid, where the river makes almost a 360 degree turn. In 1811, the geography of this area was totally reshaped by one of the strongest earthquakes ever felt in North America. The river view from the levee is expansive as one looks south from the apex of the turn. At Blytheville, we re-entered the river road and drove through the old town of Osceola. At 2.30 on Friday, there was not a soul in the streets and we almost Every building was abandoned. It was really depressing. <coughs> Our next river crossing was into Tennessee and Memphis. Just across the river, there's a huge sign for the visitor center. So we stopped for our orientation and directions. The facility is wonderful with an overhead bridge and monorail to Mud Island, one of Memphis' best attractions. Inside were larger than life bronze statues of Elvis, of course, and B.B. King. Our greeter, Jeanette was wonderful, courteous, and witty. We are ready for Southern hospitality. Uh, we found the Wyndham Garden, the north end of town. 
looked large and impressive from the inside, but I wrote the manager a list, list listing the full problems of the place. It was not clean and had deteriorated. Maybe this is the travel agent room. As you know, travel agents do get discounts in hotels, but not always the best ones. Not to be discouraged, we hopped the 60 cent Main Street trolley and took it all the way to the end and then walked back to Beale Street. A lot of buildings in the south part of the city were empty. We located the Civil Rights Museum for the following morning activity. As we returned to the more vibrant part of Memphis, blues joints were just beginning to awaken as we strolled brass musical notes embedded in the sidewalk have names of the greats. Not being Blues or Elvis fans, we may have missed the best flavor of Memphis. From the street we saw one Elvis impersonator performing. There must be many more. Live music blared from the W.C. Handy Statue Park in the middle of the stroll. We took a short beer break at Pat O'Brien's and got a recommendation for dinner. From there we walked through Peabody Place, a mall connected to the classical hotel, and bought a Johnny Cash CD. Country music, Rush Limbaugh, religious stations, and fading NPRs get a bit old on the road, so Johnny Cash was a nice diversion. <laughs> the Peabody Hotel, and uh, somebody's going to tell us about the ducks later. The Peabody is one of those places you must see. It has classic architecture, rich furnishings, perfectly maintained with attention to every detail. A nephrology convention filled the lobby and the bar, so we returned to the Blues Cafe at the west of Beale Street for catfish and barbecue shrimp. Oh yes, ample dumpling and ice cream too. We left Beale Street as the music level was rising. Our tourist buses were unloading and the streets were filling. Our walk back to the hotel took us by some interesting historical churches and buildings. The most striking was the Shelby County Courthouse. A full square block structure attempting to replicate the Parthenon. Not, unexpe <laughs> not unexpectedly, the W on the Wyndham Hotel sign had burned out. We returned to our dirty room at the Wyndham. Saturday, September 20th, Memphis to Cape Girardeau. We woke to the sound of tour buses in another beautiful morning. While not included in the rate, the breakfast helped restore a bit of faith in the window. We drove to the Civil Rights Museum, built around the Lorraine Motel where Martin Luther King was slain. This is a wonderful and extensive facility with unending exhibits and informational tours. Our second stop was at the National Ornamental Metal Museum overlooking the river, just south of Memphis. Many very ornate gates, unusual sculptures, and decorations are found both inside and on the ground in the museum. Unfortunately, no artists were working in that day. We left Memphis northbound on the East GRR. We saw many more caterpillars and much more kudzu choking the trees. Our morning stop was at Henning. The home of Alex Haley, the Roots author. Except for a few <coughs> plaques and his gravestones in the front lawn, the house was undistinguishable from others. After knocking loudly on the door, it was finally opened by Fred Montgomery. Mr. Montgomery is around 90 years old, was, very soft-spoken, and the former mayor of Henning. In fact, he told us he was the first black mayor in the country, county. For almost an hour, we listened to him tell stories of the house, Alex Haley's adventures, and the family history, and more. This was a very personal and interesting stop. We continued north on State Route 209 through Halls, Tennessee, with a surprising large number of well-kept homes, and continued our way working north along the river. In Hickman, Kentucky, known for its keyhole door buildings, in the lower town was deserted. We were, told, we were told the county courthouse had been recently remodeled 
and offered a great view of the river. After several misses, we asked directions for the man who was the retired county sheriff. He wanted to talk to us for longer than Mary Montgomery, but did get us to the right building. For a small town, Hickman was truly, this was truly a magnificent building, especially considering the condition of other parts of the town. We stopped for a candy bar and followed the Kentucky Scenic Byway to Bardwell. Remember, on this great river road, there are also several sections sponsored by the different states that are each their own scenic byways and, and their own uh, uh, nonprofit organizations. So, um, on we went. Um, we stopped in in what I thought was called Cairo, but it's pronounced Cairo, Illinoisian for, Illinoisian for Cairo, the southernmost town in the state. Once a major stop, it is now mostly totally surrounded by a levee and cut off from the river. To us it appeared cut off from everything else, and as one writer stated, a few Victorian mansions built by boat captains remain, but otherwise the GRR's passage through this town is best enjoyed with your eyes stuck firmly to the road. <laughs> oh, let's see. You cross the Mississippi at Cape Girardeau over a seriously deteriorating bridge. Coming toward us was a large 18-wheeler which shook the bridge. The new modern suspension bridge to the south will open soon. We later learned that it is a joint project between Missouri and Illinois. However, Missouri had to loan Illinois half of the money. We picked Cape Girardeau for the same reason the old river boats did. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's halfway between Memphis and St. Louis and is the largest town in the area. Our host, um, was the clinical psychologist and chairman of the Main Street Restoration Program in the Cape, a large facility at Simu, Southeast Missouri University, provided a major economic boast here. River boats also stop at the Cape. We walked down the hill to the Royal New Orleans restaurant for a dinner of duck and crab cakes while sitting at the piano bar. <coughs> well, I had some pictures of Cape Girardeau. I'll get to those in a minute. Oh, I don't know what happened to Cape Girardeau. I had some great... There we are. Cape Girardeau. Um, back to, to Southeastern Missouri University as a good historical preservation department. We learned that property taxes in Illinois are very high, but most school taxes dollars go to suburban Chicago, while many schools in smaller districts are closing. This person that we talked with was from Bloomington Normal. We asked what normal meant when we learned that the old teaching colleges were called normal schools because teachers were to normalize the citizenry. I didn't know that. With the relatively short drive ahead of us, we decided to explore Cape Girardeau by foot and visit a neighborhood winery. Our walk took us again to the campus. Next, we followed Broadway, the site much of potential restoration back to the old port area. Cape has wonderful courthouse overlooking the river, and the old buildings spread out below. A number of murals, including two very long ones on the inside and outside of the seawall, are noteworthy. River boats, tourist river boats, still visit here, but they're full of tourists rather than the goods and travelers. Antique shops, restaurants, and other shops await the tourist dollar. At one shop, I purchased a book recently written by the county prosecuting attorney entitled The Gold of Cape Girardeau. It's historical fiction which combines a love story with riverboat and Civil War history. I was able to finish it on our trip and obtained a real good feeling of what early life was like on the river. <coughs> <clears throat> we 
We did had, did find a winery. You don't think much wineries in Missouri, but there were a few. We found the River's Edge Winery, the Vintner. Jerry was supposed to be a good joke teller. Uh, he's been making wine and entertaining folks with his jokes and visiting musicians for over 20 years. We enjoyed some guitar playing, a uh, uh, tortilla roll in the large outdoor eating area. Jerry's jokes were really bad, but the wine was not too bad. <laughs> Here we are, Monday through Thursday, September 25th, 1st to 5th, 2003, our fifth elder hostel. Biking and canoeing and wine tasting at the Touch of Nature Environmental Center near Carbondale, part of Southern Illinois University. A few hours later, we arrived at the Touch of Nature Center, this large facility on Little Grassy Lake. Our purpose is to attend a five-day elder hostel to include biking, canoeing, and wine tasting. We arrived just in time to join a group in time for dinner. We had heard that Southern Illinois is really struggling economically. Well, we soon discovered that it also has some of the most beautiful, rolling, lush hills one can imagine. Northern Illinois is flat, as it was scraped by an ice rule thousands of years ago. The flow ended just north of Carbondale. I had seen a brochure on state parks of Illinois, but was unprepared for its natural beauty. We spent these days exploring and appreciating the Shawnee National Forest and efforts of many naturalists to restore this area to its natural state. <laughs> tree clearing and farming changed this area significantly. Now, tree planting, stream clearing, and other restoration have made this one of the best outdoor recreation areas in the Midwest. Surprisingly, Illinois has 40 wineries at the time, most of which have been established in the last, in the recent years. Not being outdoors folks, Joanne and I were also surprised at our ability to enjoy this very relaxed lifestyle. We bicycled over 40 miles in three days on the Tunnel Hill Trail, a reclaimed railroad bill. We canoed in three different bodies of water, including the amazing natural area, and visited three wineries. This picture on your left is a swamp. You can see it kind of yellow. There was a covering of little small uh, petals, yellow petals that covered it. It made you feel like you were going to sink into this mire instantly. Once you cleared the petals away, the water underneath was incredibly clear and pristine. Um, this would be a great site for a Stephen King novel or movie, uh, especially if it's a little darker. And the wine was okay. We also visited, well, Knob Hill Cross, the highest point in Illinois. Built in 1963, it's a national symbol of faith to God. It's actually rather amazing. Our fifth elder hostel was much more than we might have expected. The staff commute to that area is about 20 to 15 minutes, but it's through some gorgeous country with no traffic. I'm not sure we'll return to this area, but our appreciation for the recreational lifestyle has been increased significantly. Friday, September 26, Carbondale to, to St. Louis. You know you're in Southern Illinois when Cairo, Cairo is pronounced Cairo. It's Vienna pronounced is pronounced Caro. Vienna. Cairo, you... it's pronounced. Cairo. Yeah, Cairo. Yeah. Cairo. The town in Illinois is pronounced Cairo. Cairo. My home was eight miles from there. Okay. And New Madrid is pronounced New Madrid. New Madrid, correct. Okay, I got that one right. <laughs> We're now northbound on Great River Road East and various county roads. We stopped for a few minutes in Chester, the home of Popeye, the cartoon character. We're not sure why. This only other stop was in Waterloo to see the Peterson House, an old stagecoach shop and museum. It was closed. We were more interested in getting to St. Louis. Light rain 
and lightning on the horizon over the city greeted us. We entered St. Louis from the south through a rather depressed light industrial area, but we soon found the Renaissance Grand Hotel, originally the Statler Hotel. This Marriott property is just remodeled is very nice. Also centrally located right across from America's <coughs> Center Convention Facility, an easy walk to the river and subway connections. After settling in, we walked to the old courthouse, a marvelous structure, and on to the famous St. Louis Arch. Okay, what's going on? We joined the line and entered the small five-person capture for the six capsule for the 630-foot ride to the top. How many of you have done this? Okay, so you know. This is a rather eerie ride and not for the claustrophobic. Four minutes later, we were looking out of a narrow rectangular windows at the Mississippi on one side and all of St. Louis on the other. Several acres of old buildings were leveled to create the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial in 1935. One can only imagine the old buildings with up to 100 steamboats docked there years ago. Back down on the ground, uh, the display of the arches construction in the St. Louis Museum were very interesting. Okay, let's see. The local Shaffley beer that we found was pretty good, but don't tell Anheuser-Busch people about that. Here we go, there's the Lewis and Clark Museum. Um, on our way back to our hotel, let's see, da -da -da -da. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to We got lost in a hotel at this point and finally found our way, but uh, um, let's see. So this was the Lewis and Clark Museum. And then there's the Union Station in St. Louis. If you haven't been to this, this, is, this impressed me more than anything. The conversion of the Union Station uh, to a hotel with this Amazing vaulted arch inside. Um, it's an amazing uh, the hotel. Is completely redone. Much of the original meeting areas maintain the old elegance. In the morning, we also went to the Mayfair Hotel, another beautiful hotel, hotel in St. Louis. This morning we chose one major site to visit. We're now on our way on September 27th back to Chicago. We chose to go to the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. Although we have visited a number of cathedrals in Europe and the U.S., this one really surprised me. It combines Romanesque and Byzantine styles and has over 41 million pieces of mosaic glass installed throughout the structure. The whole place glitters. Its size is almost overwhelming. After we passed the edge of Forest Park, the largest of St. Louis's many recreational areas, <clears throat> it's bigger than Central Park in New York. We found many huge block square large buildings in St. Louis closed or vacant and learned this has been the case for many years. One was a square block post office. The economy has peaked and valleyed many times over its history. Mississippi river boats came first, then left with the railroad's emergence. When the center of railroad traffic moved to Chicago, St. Louis suffered again. The 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition helped considerably. A billion dollar urban renewal program including Jefferson National Expansion Memorial and the Gateway Arch have helped bring tourists. Of course, beer and professional sports helped too. We also visited uh, a live it up downtown <coughs> fair to alert to residents to the remodeled, renovated lofts and apartments. We tried to leave St. Louis over the historic Eads Bridge, but found our way blocked by a big football weekend parade and battle of bands event. So it was back to the traditional 
route across the river, river to connect with I-55, formerly Route 66 to Chicago. <coughs> we plan to go through Springfield, Illinois, in location of the Lincoln Home Natural National Historic Site, but were detoured by a large car show in the downtown area. <clears throat> we did get a glimpse of the beautiful state capitol building. Lunch followed in Williamsville with a small family restaurant. Then at Lincoln, we missed the route to Chicago, so we had our last fix of corn and soybean fields while backtracking through the no center line county roads. <clears throat> Finally, at a gas stop with coffee and pie to Boiling Brook, we think we headed towards downtown Chicago. After settling in, we took a short cab ride to the Billy Goat Tavern for a cheeseburger. This old landmark, now one of six in Chicago at the time, was the inspiration for the old Saturday Night Live sketch feeding John Belushi <clears throat> in a fast food Greek restaurant. It was timely as the Cubs had won the division title that day. The reason for the Billy Goat Tavern, the original owner had a Billy Goat and took it to the Cubs field, into the ballpark, but was turned away and thus placed a curse on the team. The curse was broken, of course. Just a block away we found Andy's, a longtime downtown jazz club, and found a young man, young pianist by the name of Dan Nimmer, and the River North Quartet astounded us. Watch for Dan Nimmer if you're jazz fans. A nice evening. Our purpose in Chicago was primarily to visit relatives. However, Sunday morning we did walk the magnificent mile. You know, I, I usually liked smaller towns and didn't like big cities so much. But when we were walking on the magnificent mile, all of a sudden, looking for a cast machine, I found a Washington Mutual Bank next to item Eddie Bauer and a Starbucks and a boy in a Nordstrom stores. I thought, wait a minute, this is Chicago. I thought it was back in Seattle. <laughs> Add that to the Boeing headquarters and I felt right at home. It's also significant that smaller versions of the Miles fancy stores can be found in Seattle. Chicago definitely needs a week or more to appreciate it. Maybe next time. Thoughts and recommendations. The Great River Road stretches from Winnipeg to New Orleans. Each state along the way has its several publications and brochures. The website, www.greatriverroad.greatriver.com, is very good. Several official scenic byways and other driving and recreational trails follow the river as well. One is the Mississippi River Trail, a 10-state cycling trail which is under development at the time. Another good source of information is the book Road Trip USA by Jamie Jensen, Moon Travel Handbooks, which includes the Great River Road as one of 11 cross-country adventures on America's two-lane highways. I expected the road to follow the river more closely than it does. One must take time to make a number of side trips to really get a feel of the area. The variety of topography and vegetation, as well as the size and nature of its towns and cities, provides something for every tourist. Of course, the best way might be to see the Mississippi as it did in those days of old on a riverboat cruise, but I don't think you can go back. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go back and try and turn on the light. Let's have some stories. Okay. Especially from those who know the area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For all of those of you who have uh, been to Memphis, how many of you been to Mud Island? <coughs> a couple of us, anyway. <laughs> Mud Island has a uh, model of the Mississippi, and it must be about what, four or five <coughs> blocks long. And it shows all of the depth changes in the river throughout its course 
but it uh, provides an interesting way of looking at uh, what happened along uh, the uh, river. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is the hotel that you uh, referred to in Memphis that had ducks inside. Uh, it's a, an interesting place to go either early in the morning or late in the afternoon. But the ducks are in a little uh, pond in the middle of the uh, hotel lobby uh, and they are tended by a duck tender that uh, keeps them there and uh, then uh, as they're getting ready to uh, return, they live up on the, the top floor of the hotel. And uh, I think they eat rather well up there. But these ducks are changed about every four months. Uh, but uh, the crowd will get around in the evening and sing to them so that they can go to the elevator and go back to their home. Or, in the morning when they arrive, but it's an interesting sight. Um, I was born one town from the New Madrid Fault in the very northwest corner of Tennessee. So, uh, and I also had I had an aunt who lived in near Bardwell, Kentucky, who commuted daily to Cairo, where she taught high school home at. So this is my uh, home country, so to speak. I grew up in Jackson, Missouri, which was the, was the county seat of Cape Girardeau County. Thank you. I know there are some other St. Louis uh, visitors and uh, people who've worked there and maybe other stops along this road you have some stories about that, that I may have missed. Um, I spent 43 years in St. Louis and learned that if you were a native you said Missouri just like she did. And if you were anyone else in the world you said Missouri. So we always could tell the minute somebody walked in the door <laughs> which group they were from. That's like when you ask people visiting Washington State to, to give the name of that little town that's near Tacoma, called Pally Loop. <laughs> John, did you drive? Were you driving on this or busing? Yeah. No, we were driving. We had our own car. Um, not our own car, we rented a car. What about the elder hostel? Just a few interesting historic notes to add. Um, in the uh, close. terrible fungus loss of uh, vineyards in France, uh, stock from, uh, uh, from Missouri grape plants rescued the French wine industry totally. That was in the mid 1800s. So even though the French, the Missouri wines may have been sort of midland, they did save the French wine industry. Also the, um, let's see, Cairo is also the place of the Monsanto factory, which was for many decades dumping uh, toxic materials into the Mississippi River. And I was part of an effort to make the public aware of that by you know, creating movies and so forth. Um, St. Charles, the wonderful, charming river town that you mentioned, still preserved in much of the uh, era's architecture, was one of the places where the Lewis and Clark uh, team in, disembarked for the West, and also was one of the major refueling or starting points of the westward expansion, which explains why the Gateway Arch was so uh, emblematic of St. Louis and its role in the westward expansion. End of story. Thank you very much for an informative. I wish I had done the same driving trip. <laughs> I lived in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas for many years, so uh, I went to Memphis uh, uh, on occasion, you you failed to say much about the chief uh, 
uh, site in Memphis, the home of Elvis Presley. Uh, my brother came to uh, visit us, and I was hoping to take him uh, to that metals museum that uh, you refer to, but he wanted to go and see Elvis's home. And uh, I'd never been there, and uh, I have to admit it was pretty interesting. It was pretty much what you would expect from someone who had too much money and too little taste. <laughs> well, considering uh, too little taste, I'll tell a tale that Navu and Joseph Smith kind of reminded me of. Seems that the Pope had called all his cardinals in and he told them I have good news and bad news. And uh, Oh, Father, tell us the good news first. What could be so wonderful? And it's, well, Jesus is coming back to earth. Oh, wow, wonderful. After that, what could be the bad news? Well, he's coming back to Salt Lake City. <laughs> I told you it wasn't in very good taste. <laughs> you know, one more thing. I always wonder, talk about some of these beautiful roads. Of course, Route 66 is a classic one, and the Lincoln Highway is another. But I always wondered, why do you drive on a parkway and park on a driveway? <laughs> in, in thinking about driving on roads, there's a great book that was came out, I think, about 1982 or 83, by William Least Heat Moon called Blue Highways. Oh. And if you've never read it, I would really recommend it. It's it's a it's a great read. Here, here. Yes. They call them blue. Do you know why they call them blue highways? Because they're blue on the map. On the maps, they're blue. Yeah. The, the red ones are or divided ones are bigger if you look at the index. So. Oh. We took a trip one time trying to follow blue highway, blue roads to go across Washington State in the most northern roads that you could find. Um, unfortunately, you have to remember, parts of Washington State in the east, because of the topography, were more oriented towards Canada. So neighbors were Canadian, and they didn't worry about the, the 49th parallel. And so, anyway, we were able to go across there, but frequently on those roads you end up in somebody's driveway or or, or a cow path someplace, and, and uh, so uh, the blue highway maps help, but uh, going on your own and talking to locals is even more fun. So I was born 25 miles south where the arch stands and grew up there. And uh, when I was a senior in college at Washington University in St. Louis, I lived uh, on the 12th floor of a dorm, and I could just barely see past another similar dorm uh, it, where the arch was being completed at that time. I graduated in July, June 1966. Um, so it, it's been very interesting hearing what you and others have had to say. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> God willing, we got a couple more <clears throat> that I'm working on. One is dividing the old railroads in uh, Colorado. Another is uh, uh, the other Greece parts that we visited, and finally uh, studying the azulejos in Portugal. So the azulejos are the tiles in Portugal. So, um, I hope I can do those next time. Yeah. Okay. Okay.